So, you already know my uh, bias towards biological versus uh, you know artificial solutions. I am a big proponent of uh, high tibial osteotomy. Uh, only thing is that uh, I prefer to use a fixator for doing the high tibial osteotomies. I am quite aggressive about counseling patients for uh, osteotomy and uh, I want to sort of make my case uh, to you for you all to adopt the same kind of um, strategy, not necessarily the same method, but certainly to look at osteotomy as one of the um, solutions for patients who have got medial compartment osteoarthritis. If you go for um, look at the deformity principles, you know we draw a proximal axis, we draw a distal axis. And where these two lines intersect and where you see the blue uh, dotted line that is known as the bisector line and your cora or the hinge around which you sort of correct this deformity is either on the medial side if you are doing a closing wedge, this is where the uh, closing wedge would hinge closed and this is where the opening wedge would hinge open. If your cora is at this level biomechanically you get a good correction without any real residual uh, deformity. I use uh, an orthofix type of uh, fixator locally manufactured where uh, we put in I'll, you know I am not going to go too much into detail about the operative procedure that is available on a video on the web. But what we do basically is put in two pins into the proximal region of the tibia in a transverse orientation and two pins distally and then I do the osteotomy through a you know a 1 centimeter incision. What is different about this osteotomy is it is distal to the tuberosity and the importance of that is, is especially in patients who have got a lot of metaphyseal virus where the amount of deformity can be quite significant. If you go to correct those deformities with an osteotomy proximal to the tuberosity, there is a tendency to increase the patellofemoral um, pressure and to change the patellar height. So, a distal to the tuberosity osteotomy does not change the patellar height whereas an osteotomy proximal to the tuberosity does change the height. Um, <clears throat> again distal to the osteotomy does not increase patellofemoral pressure which you know may not be important in small degrees of, of correction, but a lot of our patients who have got metaphyseal virus this aspect becomes important. So, the osteotomy goes, the osteotomy is uh, from medial to lateral and um, aiming for the tip of the uh, head of the fibula, but not cutting the lateral cortex. So, the lateral cortex remains as a hinge. So, you remember that picture which I showed you about the cora, this is about where the cora for an opening wedge osteotomy comes. So, though the osteotomy is lower than the hinge, the cora is at the tip of the fibula. So, biomechanically this leads to a good correction. You will see in the coming pictures how that works. On table you can do what I call the cotricord test, hold the cotricord over the center of the head and the center of the ankle and uh, in the middle is the picture before distraction and on the right side is the picture after distraction. So, when you distract this and this wedge has uh, opened out over here, the mechanical axis as represented by the cotricord gets centered. We then shut this down, we compress it back again and patient comes out of theater with the leg as deformed as it was before. So, this is the immediate post-op picture and over a period of usually 2 to 3 weeks by uh, distraction at 1 millimeter per day. This changes from a varus of the proximal tibia to a significant amount of valgus. Notice in the pictures from the left to right, the lateral cortex is intact and all the hinging has taken place over the uh, around the um, area at the tip of the fibula. So, patient who whose varus looked like this at the end of 3 weeks uh, looks like what you see on the right. <laughs> now, what is adequate valgus? If you look at the literature, uh, there are two things that are, there are two sort of indices which are used. One is the hip knee ankle uh, angle which should be 
183 to 186. Normal mechanical axis would be straight that is 180 degrees, but here because you already have um, medial compartment arthritis, you want to shift some of the load onto the lateral side. So that is usually achieved by going for 183 to 186. Now obviously if you do this too much, if you give too much valgus, you are going to recreate that problem on the lateral side. So therefore this very narrow range of, of 3 degrees. And the second thing is the weight bearing line passing through the base of the um, <coughs> uh, lateral tibial spine, what is known as the Fujisawa point. So these two indices are what we use to ensure that okay, this is uh, appropriate correction. At the end of three months, once the bone is healed because this was gradual distraction, so the regenerate forms, it solidifies and you take off the fixator, you have a tibia, proximal tibia which looks as normal as can be. Um, <coughs> if, if you had not seen the earlier um, x-rays where the osteotomy was done, not many of you would be able to sort of say that there is anything really abnormal with this uh, proximal tibia. So why the fixator, what is the big deal about the fixator rather than do it, doing it the conventional way? Uh, there are issues that I have with the uh, standard sort of open, open wedge. The amount of correction uh, that you need to do sometimes gives you, uh, pro not sometimes, many a times gives you a problem. I will show you that in a, in a slide now. And to achieve precise correction with an internal fixation means once you put the plate on, you cannot change this uh, correction. And my experience has shown that there is, despite all this planning, there is a certain amount of imprecision in the planning that we do. Because you are doing your surgery in a supine non-weight bearing position and real life is in an erect uh, weight bearing manner. <laughs> so the way I plan it is we do this planned weight bearing line which is a line extended from the center of the head of the femur such that it passes through the base of the lateral tibial spine on a standing x-ray. Then you project the position of the ankle onto this uh, weight bearing line. This gives you the angle of correction, the acute angle between these two um, red lines. And that same angle, if you project it onto the proximal tibia with the apex around the uh, tip of the fibula, will give you the amount of wedge that needs to be opened. This kind of planning can be used even for conventional um, opening wedge. Remember that 1 degree is not equal to 1 millimeter in, in this situation. This was, that was Coventry's sort of rule of thumb for a tibia which was of a particular size. It is always better to actually uh, read it off the film rather than take the estimate. Now this is the problem. <laughs> when you do weight bearing films, these patients have varus, there is a certain amount of laxity and once you correct it, these joint lines become uh, sort of parallel. So should you add this amount of angulation to whatever correction you are doing or should you subtract it to whatever you are doing? What I have found with my experience is that this swings sort of both ways and there is no definite rule which will tell you that all right, if your varus is you know 20 degrees and this angle which you see the red line. Um, is the mask on, which, which you see over here, if that is 5 degrees, should I correct 15 degrees or should I correct 25 degrees? That is a question which is not very easy to answer. With the fixator, that is a big advantage. <laughs> so all this planning I do, I still get sometimes uh, under correction, not very common, but I do get it. Now that is not a very difficult problem when I have a fixator, like in this patient where we planned for a certain amount of correction and now if you see the green line, it is not through the base of the, um, it is not through the base of the um, lateral tibial spine. The angle is 182 degrees. All I have to do is continue distraction, call the patient after 3 days and I have an adequate amount of valgus and the axis passing through the base of the tibial spine. So, I am able to get my correction perfect every time. In 20 percent of the cases, I find that with this planning also, we have over corrected. 
like this patient where we did all that planning and decided okay this patient needs so many millimeters of distraction therefore so many days of correction and called back after that many days did the full length x-ray you can see that the green line which is the weight bearing line is way over onto the lateral side. Now with that much over correction this patient's medial arthritis is going to you know uh, get sort of pain free but she runs the risk of developing lateral arthritis in the future. With a fixator on all we have to do is turn the fixator in the reverse direction till you get your axis perfectly correct. So in our um, study when we look at if you look at all the other studies uh, when we look at the 183 to 186 criterion in lot of the other studies the, the maximum is only 25 percent of the time. Uh, we were able to achieve it 54 percent of the time but even that is not a sort of correct thing because we are using a combination of the angle as well as where the line passes through the um, tibial spine. And this is important because all the literature shows that the long term results of a high tibial osteotomy only correlate with the axis correction. They do not correlate with the weight of the patient, they do not correlate with the amount of uh, damage in the preoperative x-rays, they do not correlate with the age of the patient at the time of surgery. The only thing that correlates to long term results, good results of a high tibial osteotomy is the precision of the correction. The scars, these are all sort of side benefits, scars are very small. So even if I am aggressive in pushing this for a younger patient, ultimately this osteotomy will last for 12 years, 15 years. But at the end of that time that patient is going to require a knee replacement. So at that time you do not want to spoil the field for a future knee replacement where you know badly placed scars can create trouble for a future knee replacement. With a conventional closing wedge osteotomy uh, especially if you do a large amount of correction you require different kinds of stems, you require offset stems or you run the risk of the stem perforating the um, canal as you see over here. But when you do the osteotomy this way what you see on the left is that you know T-shaped figure that, that simulates the existence of a stem. So you take your normal TKR cut, use a normal stem and this is as good as a primary TKR. So in conclusion uh, I would like to sort of urge you not to treat patients who have knee pain or especially medial joint knee pain with just anti-inflammatory medications and sort of tell them that all right now you have to live with this when it gets bad enough come and do a knee replacement. There is definitely a role for delaying the, ex the, the requirement for a knee replacement and if you do it early enough probably changing the natural history of the osteoarthritis. But for that you have to look at the alignment from a distance like this where even visually you can pick up the varus alignment and then if you, if you see that there is varus alignment and the patient has got symptoms primarily on the medial side you should definitely consider um, early osteotomy. You need not do it the way that I have shown but whatever method you use try to be as accurate as you can in terms of planning and try to be as accurate as you can in terms of uh, ex execution. Thank you. The video is available on uh, YouTube, the operative uh, video. Thank you.